John chapter 20 is an awesome chapter in the Word of God because it's the chapter that comes after Jesus rises from the dead, after he has conquered. And uh, in this chapter, we see people doubting his resurrection. Some of the ladies come to the tomb and they find the, the body of Jesus gone. Jesus appears to some, and Jesus appears to some that are walking in the country. And we're picking it up here in John 20 and verse 19. John 20 and 19 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And I want you to hear that verse this morning. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. I'm going to be talking for a few minutes this morning about our mission, the mission of the body of Christ. You know, as a pastor, I listen to a lot of other pastors talking. And when they're not in the pulpit, they talk about uh, issues. Now, uh, issues is the modern term for problems. You know, we don't have problems anymore. We have issues. Well, I don't know about you, but I have more problems than I have issues. <clears throat> but anyway, if you get together with a bunch of pastors, you'll, you'll hear them talking about things that trouble them. Probably the top concern among pastors when it comes to ministering is the fact that uh, church attendance is not at an overabundance. They talk about empty pews. They talk about how hard it is to get folks to come to Sunday school. They talk about how hard it is to get people to come to prayer meetings. In fact, I've heard people say, well, I'm not going tonight. It's just a prayer meeting. And that's a sad statement because Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He didn't say a house of preaching. He said a house of prayer. They talk about how hard it is to get people to be faithful with their tithe. And, you know, the list goes on. And, of course, the saddest thing, and we're seeing more and more of this, is seeing churches have to close their doors. That's a heartbreaker. I've listened to reasons that um, pastors give for why they believe that's happening. And, um, you know, some say, well, it's just a sign of the times. Others will say, well, it's because people don't see the need to come. Some people say, well, folks are working too hard and they need the weekends to rest. But when Paul wrote his second letter to Timothy, he gave us the real reasons. And I want you to look at this with me this morning. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, here's the reason that we see so many empty pews in church. Here's the reason we see so many people not wanting to come or feeling the urge to come to church or come to Sunday school or come to prayer meeting. Why people feel like that they would rather rest or sleep in or do their own thing on weekends. Here's the reason. Paul knew these things were going to happen because the Holy Spirit spoke to him and inspired him to write the words I'm about to read to you. Second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That word perilous literally in the Greek means times that are hard to take, times that drain the life out of you, times that are dangerous. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. As you read what Paul was writing to Timothy, and Paul knew this was going to happen, and he was instructing Timothy, this is what you can be aware of, but also for us, because God saw fit to include it in the Holy Scripture. He said, yeah, what we're seeing today is a sign of the times, that's true, and it is because the people have come to think that self is more important than the things of God. But the real problem 
And I believe this with all my heart. The real problem is in the last verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You see, the power for a Christian, the power for a church is the Holy Spirit. The power is the Holy Spirit. And faith in the name of Jesus. Those are two things that we must have if we're going to be able to do what we were called to do. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. And we've got to truly believe in the power and authority contained in the name of Jesus Christ. You've got to have it. A problem today in so many churches is we don't focus on the Holy Spirit. We deny that miracles are for today. We say the gifts of the Spirit are not for today. We deny the power, and therefore, we're left with a form, a ritual, a ceremony with no power. That's why pews are empty. That's why people don't come. They don't come because the world is desperately looking for power. They're looking for something supernatural. That's why you see so many odd, strange, weird beliefs and practices. That's why you see so much interest in the occult. That's why you see so much interest in, in just any kind of mysticism and any kind of spiritualism. People are desperately searching for the miraculous. Something to believe in that is stronger than they are. Because, folks, if we are it, if we are the culmination of, of power and wisdom in this universe, we're in trouble. God gave us the power. Now listen to me. God gave us the power that brought the universe into existence. And yet we deny that. And we deny it because we don't believe it. We don't have it. We're not seeing it made manifest in our churches. And therefore, since it's not happening in our church, it can't be for today. Because we're not seeing people healed right and left, because we're not seeing the, the lame restored, because we're not seeing the blind brought back to sight, because we're not seeing this stuff, it can't be for today because our church is right on the money. We have a form of godliness, but we deny the power when we deny the power, the manifestation, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why we see churches as they are. Sure, it's the last day. Sure, it's perilous times. But let me tell you something. People flock to something that's powerful. Why do you think that we watch explosions on TV? Why do you think everybody is drawn to a fire wherever it is? We are looking. We're just drawn to power. And the church has none. And that's why people aren't drawn to the church. Now, thank God it's not true all over the world. There are churches that are full of the power of God, full of the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders are taking place. But so much of the church in first world nations, when they look at that, they say, that's just a, that's a, that's a cult. That's, that's something strange, and that's not for today. You know, on and on and on. Folks, there's nowhere in the Word of God that it tells us that you can function without the fullness of the Holy Spirit and do what God has called us to do. There's nowhere in the Word of God that says, I'm going to turn the tap off. I'm going to shut off the spigot when the last days come, and you're just going to have to get by on your own. It doesn't say that anywhere. So we have a form of godliness so much of the first world church and deny the power thereof. Listen to what Jesus said. We just read it. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And the next verse says, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That ought to tell you something. If he's sending us as the Father sent him, well, what did the Father send him to do? Well, he came to do what? Reveal the Father, right? He came to reveal the Father. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. And, of course, it's talking about God the Father. Nobody's seen him. 
So God, in the fullness of time, sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. And he became the exact representation, the exact image of God the Father. He came to reveal the Father. All right. How did he do that? Well, I shared a little bit of it with the children this morning. The first sermon that Jesus preached was in that synagogue at, at, uh, in Nazareth. And he began to read from Isaiah chapter 61, and he told them that today that scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Well, let's look at what he was reading. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61, and you'll begin to see how Jesus came to reveal the Father. Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 1. Now, this is the text. The Bible says Jesus came in, and, and as was his custom, he asked for the scroll of Isaiah. And he found the place where this is written, and he began to read it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, he didn't read this part. And the day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. All right. The way that he revealed his father was by doing his father's will and by doing signs, wonders, and miracles as he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. It takes the miraculous, it takes the supernatural to reveal the supernatural. God is supernatural. That means he's above the natural. That means he's beyond what you and I can do. He's beyond what is physically possible in this world. And it takes something that's beyond what you and I can do. Something that's beyond the realm of the natural to reveal something that's beyond the realm of the, realm of the natural. So God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and enabled him to do those things. What did he do? Think about it for a minute. He said, well, I've come to bring good news to the poor. He said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. He came to set at liberty those that were bruised, and he began to go on. And Jesus began to demonstrate it by healing those with hands that were withered up. He began to demonstrate that very thing by touching the blind and causing them to see. He began to touch the lepers that were almost dead from that disease and restored them completely to health. Wherever he went, that demonic spirits were oppressing or possessing people, they had to flee at his name. That's what Jesus did to reveal the Father, that the Father might be glorified. How did he do it? Well, the Bible says that when he came out of the wilderness, after all that time of testing, after all the temptation that Satan subjected him to, and understand something. You have never encountered a temptation that Jesus was not subjected to and overcame. And he overcame it because the Bible said he came out of that wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on Jesus at his baptism in the Jordan River. And he came from that baptism and went out and began to minister anointed by the Holy Spirit empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says the fame of him went all through the region. Folks, when a church is full of the power of the Holy Spirit, and the things of the Holy Spirit begin to manifest themselves in that church, the fame of that church will go all through the region. Listen, some people will make fun. Some people will ridicule. Some people will denigrate. Some people will condemn. Other people will come to see what's going on, and the Holy Spirit will touch their hearts, and they'll be saved. The same thing happened with Jesus. What did they say? He casts out devils by the prince of devils. 
They, they called him all kinds of things. They said he was a blasphemer. But listen, the people with needs flocked to him, and he healed them, and he saved them, and he did whatever was necessary. Now, the Bible says that he came to reveal the Father. And he revealed the Father through the supernatural acts that the Holy Spirit empowered him to do. Understand this today. Jesus Christ lived on this earth as a human being. You need to understand it. Jesus didn't do all those things as God. He did it as a human being empowered with the Holy Spirit. And the reason he did that is so that you and I can do those things. If he had only done it because he was God, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have proved that we can live you know, you know, with the same power in us that he had. But he lived as a human being filled with the Holy Ghost. And he went out and did those things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now listen. He said, as my Father sent me, so send I you. So if he came to reveal the Father, what are we supposed to be doing? Revealing Jesus. We're supposed to be revealing Jesus, and we're supposed to be doing it in the same way that Jesus revealed the Father through the miraculous. We have been called, we have been chosen to do exactly what the Word says, to reveal Him. Jesus wants us to go to this lost, sin-soaked, sin-sick world and reveal Him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We're to reveal him as the mighty warrior that has defeated Satan, death, hell, and the grave. We're to reveal him as the great physician that heals our diseases by the stripes that he bore on his back. We're to reveal him as the king of kings and the lord of lords at which every name must bow, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess his lordship, and the one who is soon to return to this earth to rule and to reign. That's what we're commissioned to do, is to go and do that. Well, how in the world can we do it? We have to do it the same way Jesus did, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Back to John for a minute. John chapter 20, where we were. And let me read these last two verses of that chapter. It says, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. What does that tell you? It tells you this. The miraculous signs and wonders are for us for a purpose. And that purpose is so people will believe. You know, we can stand and argue all day long. We can stand and debate you know, we can, we can do Christian apologetics. We can give all the reasons why we believe. And to many people, that's still just an argument. But when you demonstrate the supernatural power of Almighty God, people can't argue with it. And that's what the church needs. We've got to get away from, you know, our, our debates of theology. We've got to get away from empty ceremony and circumstance and, and, you know, whatever is going on. And we've got to get back to the power of the Holy Ghost that enables us to preach the gospel under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We've got to get back to the power of the Holy Ghost that enables us to lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. We've got to get back to the power of the Holy Ghost that will cause demons to flee when we come. We've got to get back to the power of the Holy Ghost if we want to see people People say, if we want to see churches full of the people looking for help. You see, the church is not designed to be a social club. The church is not designed to be a place where people come because that's what's expected. The church is designed to be a place where people come to seek help in time of need. A church is a place where people need to come to get on their knees before God and get their life right with God and then have their needs met, whether it be healing, whether it be set free from captivity, whether they need to get the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, the oil of joy for mourning. That's what church is supposed to be. That's where we've got to get back to. And folks, if we, can, if we will do that, then you'll see churches filled to overflowing. You will see people congregating early just to get a seat. I've seen it. I know it works. Some of the most amazing experiences in my life were spent on the island of Cuba. People are under communism. They are not free. They're impoverished. 
They're suffering. But man, let me tell you something. They are in love with Jesus like nobody I've ever seen. When you, you know, you, you go on a mission trip and, and you get together and, and you go to the church. And you get there early. You know, our idea of early is one minute after. As long as you get there within 10 minutes of the time, you know it's going to be all right. Folks, these people get to church hours early. They get there for a couple of reasons. One, they want to be able to get in the building. The other is they know that when people start assembling, they're going to start worshiping God. And when you come, you know, a lot of times we would arrive in a bus, we'd arrive in a taxi or something, and you would hear it before you got on the block. Man, the windows were all open, and that wasn't just because it was hot in the building. It was because the crowd in the yard and the crowd in the street wanted to hear the praises of God going on in the building. They wanted to hear the Word of God taught. They wanted to hear what God was doing. They wanted to know when somebody was healed. They wanted to know when some person that had been demonically possessed was set free. You see, there's, there's a lot of Santeria in Cuba. Santeria, of course, is a blend of Catholicism and Haitian voodoo. And it's, it's diabolical and it's deadly. And I've seen so many people that practice this, that were demon-possessed, that were set free, gloriously saved, and became pillars in the church, if not pastors in the church. But it's amazing. I've got pictures and videos of churches that were crammed to the rafters and people hanging in the windows and the yards are full and the streets are full. It looked like a block party. Because they were so hungry for Jesus and because they knew that inside that building the power of God was being released. And here in this nation, we complain because we have empty seats. We complain because we can't get people to come. We can't understand why people don't want to be here. And I'll tell you why. A form of godliness, but denying the power. As long as we say the Holy Spirit's not for today. Oh, preacher, I wouldn't say that. We have to have the Holy Spirit in us to be saved. Well, that's true. But the Bible says, be ye filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. You know, there's a difference between a little dab and a whole bunch. God wants it running out of us. He wants it overflowing. What did Jesus say? He said, there will be a river, a spring that just flows from your innermost being. The Word of God says, there is a river, the streams where I'll make glad the city of God. God gave Ezekiel a vision of a river that flowed from the altar and it went out into the countryside and everything that it touched came to life. And that's the Holy Spirit, folks. Listen, we've got to get back to the power of God and the power of God is the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we've got a form of godliness and no power. If we're to fulfill our mission, the house of God has to be a house of prayer and a house of power. Now, turn with me to John 14. You've got to see this. You may have seen it, but you really need to see it again for the first time. John 14, as Jesus is telling his disciples he's about to leave. He said, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I know that troubles your heart, but don't. Don't let it. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you. And I'm going to take you to be with me. And, of course, they had that discussion. We don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? And he said, listen, I'm the way. <laughs> don't worry about it. You trust me, and you're on the way. You put your hope and faith and trust in me. Now, in verse 12, he tells them something that I don't know if they ever believed. But you've got to believe it because it's in there. And it's in red in my Bible, which means Jesus said it. Okay? Verily, verily. Now, truly, truly. You know, when God repeats himself, he's serious. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Well, remember those works? Healing the sick, raising the dead, restoring sight to the blind, restoring limbs to the maimed, all those things. And we say, hmm, that definitely must not be for today. But Jesus was talking to those that were following him. And he said, you're going to do 
what I do. Boy, that's heavy, isn't it? Is that not amazing? And he said, oh, you're going to do even more than I do. The reason is because I go to the Father. What's, what's the deal about going to the Father? Here's what he said. If I go to the Father, he will send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he will be with you and in you. With you and in you. In you is in you. With you is like on you. All right? What did John say? He said, the one that's coming after me, I'm not worthy to unloose his sandals. But here's the thing. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. I don't remember if it was Leonard Ravenhill. Some great old man of God made this statement. He said, you know something? He said, incense does not offer up its aroma without fire. You got to have fire under that incense or fire in that incense for it to rise up before God. And folks, we don't have fire. So we're not producing that sweet aroma that the world needs to smell that pleases God so much. You got to have fire. And the fire is the Holy Ghost. We got a form and no power. We got incense and no fire. But we got to have the fire. We got to have the fire. What does the church need? If we're going to do what Jesus said, reveal him to the world. And do what he did as he revealed the Father. And even greater, what do we need? We need three things. We need the faith to believe the power in the name of Jesus. Man, think about it. <clears throat> Every time his name was mentioned, something happened. Demons would cry out and they'd try to get away. Every time the name of Jesus was mentioned, it grabbed hold of people and they either bowed before it or ran from it. We've got to realize how much power is in the name of Jesus. Then, other than the faith in his name, we need boldness. And we need boldness to ask the Father to give us the fullness of the Spirit. Not just a little. We need a lot. We need overflowing. We need baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And then we need nerve. We need the nerve to step out in the power of the Holy Spirit and begin to do what Jesus did. We need the nerve to begin to go to people and say, what's hurting? I'm going to lay hands on you, and I'm going to pray for you, and God's going to heal you. We've got to get back to boldness. We've got to get back to faith, and we've got to get back to just pure old raw nerve. You see, you'll never know that you can walk on water till you get out of the boat. You'll never know that you can do these things until you step out. Jesus said, listen, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus has promised to be with us. Jesus has promised that we're going to do these things. Now we've got to get back to faith that says, I believe what Jesus said. I believe the power in his name. And I believe what he said in the last chapter of the book of Mark. He said, those that believe in my name, they'll cast out devils. In my name, they will speak with new tongues. In my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now that's God's promise. Now we either believe it or we don't. And if we don't believe it, we don't have a chance. Because if we don't believe that, we have no reason to believe John 3.16. And if we don't believe John 3, 16, we have no hope in this world. We've got to get back to faith in the name of Jesus. We've got to have the boldness to say, Lord, I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care if I jump up and down and scream. I don't care if I roll on the floor. I don't care if I speak in tongues. It doesn't matter. I need the fullness, the power of the Holy Ghost so I can do what you commissioned me to do. And then I need the boldness and the nerve to go out and say, I'm going to put into practice what Jesus promised that I could do. 
I'm going to find somebody that's sick, and I'm going to lay hands on them in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to expect them to be healed. I'm going to find somebody that needs to know Jesus, and I'm going to go and share the good news with them, and I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit's going to convict their heart and give me the privilege of leading them to Jesus Christ. I'm going to believe that. Folks, that's where we've got to be. There's, there's probably 120 churches in this county. And I dare say there's not one of them this morning that's full. Most of them aren't half full. A lot of them aren't a third full. Why is that? Because, folks, we are not grabbing on to the promise of God. Jesus said, you wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. And the promise was the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, we have downgraded that to mean, oh, well, that means that when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. No, that's not the case. Remember John 20, when Jesus rose from the dead and he went in to where his disciples were and they were freaked out because he was standing there and, and he didn't even open the door to come in the room. And they think he's dead, and he's standing there saying, don't panic, peace be unto you, it's all right, calm down. It is me, look, look at my hands, look at my side. What did he do? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. That's the moment those disciples were saved. You see, you can't be saved unless the Holy Spirit comes in here and borns you again. Boy, that's terrible grammar. Anyway, you can't be saved till the Holy Spirit comes in there and gives you that new heart, all right? But Jesus hung out with them off and on for 40 days. But he said, listen, don't leave home without what's about to happen. He said, you wait, just hang here at Jerusalem. Ten days after Jesus ascended into heaven, they were all together in that upper room, and they were praying, and they were waiting on God. And the Bible says they were all in one accord, and that doesn't mean a Honda, okay? They were all in unity, loving one another and loving God. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, second chapter of Acts, there came a sound like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the room where they were. And it looked like cloven tongues of fire that sat on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke in tongues. Yes, they did. And they emptied out of this room. And they went out into the street. And thousands of people were saved. Why? Because the power of God was with them. If that hadn't happened, if the Holy Spirit hadn't come in fullness, they had the Holy Spirit in them. Jesus had already breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. They would have went out and they could have argued with the people in the streets. They could have told some things, but you wouldn't have seen the scene that took place. Because when they came out of that room, they were full of the Holy Ghost. And they were walking out in the street. And I don't know how it sounded, but it was probably something like, Kalabashida Makatasa. I don't know. But the miracle was, <laughs> the miracle was that everybody heard in their native language. And they said, man, these people aren't from where we are, but we're hearing in our own language the awesome works of God. Why? Because they were full of the Holy Ghost. There was fire on these guys. And they came out with fire in their hearts. And they began to minister the good news of Jesus Christ. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit fell on that crowd. And thousands of people were added to the church that day. Can you imagine what would happen if 120 churches in Yancey County got full of the Holy Ghost? Can you imagine what happened if the people in those churches went out and began to do what Jesus called us to do? Lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, do whatever he, the need is and begin to lead people to Jesus? Man, you'd see churches packed out and you would see a county that was full of the power and joy of the Lord. You would see drugs beginning to disappear. You would see demons fleeing from this place. And folks, we're infested. Now, how do I know that? Well, let me give you an example. This is one that you can ponder on. If you listen to a scanner, if you listen to the police communication, the ambulance service, you will see things happen in waves. The other day, I was working and listening at the same time. They were working two or three suicides at the same time. Now, that's not coincidence. That's a spirit. Then another day will come along, and you'll, a couple of days ago, I was listed, 
four multiple car accidents at the same time. And then it goes on. And then you'll have another day that's domestic. You got husbands and wives beating each other up, shooting each other. You got, you know, families fighting among themselves. Now, don't tell me that you've got this day set aside for domestic disputes. You've got this day set aside for suicide. You've got this day set aside for, for traffic accidents. Folks, now listen. That's not coincidence. It's spiritual. Everything that happens in the physical is a manifestation of something that's taking place in the spirit. Jesus said, in my name, you'll cast out devils. When the church becomes what the church is destined to become, and it will, as God is my witness today, I believe it with all my heart. When the church realizes without the power of the Holy Spirit, we're a social club. When the church realizes that without the fullness of the Holy Ghost, we can do nothing. And we began to, with all boldness, cry out, Father God, fill me with your promise. Baptize me till I am overflowing. When we begin to do that, we can begin to set the captives free. We can begin to put demonic forces to flight. Man, wherever Jesus went, they cried out and they fled. And Jesus said, as my Father sent me, so send I you. It's time that God's people, full of the Holy Ghost, go forth and do that wrestling, not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. If we want our, our county back, if we want our communities back, if we want our families back, if we want to see the meth labs gone, if we want to see the drug addiction broken, if we want to see all these other things put out of here and peace restored, it's only through the power of the Holy Ghost. You cannot legislate. You cannot politically solve. You can't do those things. It has to be done by the power of the living God. That's the only way it'll work. If we want our nation back, the church has to get on her knees and repent of her deadness and repent of her sin and repent of her compromise and say, God, forgive me. Fill me with your power and raise up that army that will go forth and put the enemy to flight. Amen. That's what has to happen. That's our mission. That's what we've been commissioned to do. Now, I've had people tell me, I don't want to go to church because it's boring. Let me tell you something. When you get in a service where people are being healed, demons are crying out, let me out of here now. It ain't boring, children. Where the presence of God is, where the power of the Holy Ghost is, it's not boring. Sometimes I've seen people that were not right with God have the hair stand up on their neck and knock the door down going out. But that's all right, because the Holy Spirit will chase people down if you'll ask him to. We've got to get back to that, folks. We've got to get back to it. We've got to have faith and boldness, fullness of the Holy Ghost, and the nerve to step out and do what God has called us to do. It takes the supernatural to reveal the supernatural. God never intended for his people to do what was needed on their own. God never intended for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel on our own. It won't work. The things of God are spiritually discerned. They're revealed by the Holy Spirit. So the greatest, one of the greatest things that Satan has ever been able to accomplish was to make the church of God afraid of God. Think about it. We're not afraid of Jesus. Oh, man, he's the one that came and died on the cross. We're not afraid of God the Father because most of us have a vision of him as being some, you know, just awesome great-grandfather <laughs> that pets us, you know. Oh, poor little thing. He ain't that way, by the way. <laughs> he does love us more than you can ever imagine but he's also holy and he's also righteous and he also says the wages of sin is death you see he is a father but he's strict and the reason he's strict is because he hates sin and the reason he hates sin is because of what it does to his children but even though we're comfortable with Jesus and pretty comfortable with the Father, we are scared to death of the Holy Ghost. And I don't know why, because He's God too. 
And he's the one that caused the universe to come into existence. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. He was the force that brought it into existence. All down through the Bible, you see, wherever something awesome was done, wherever a victory was won, the Holy Spirit was the one that caused it to happen. The Spirit of God would come on those people and they could do what no man could do. And Satan knows that when the church realizes and when the church embraces and not only embraces but begs, Lord, baptize me, fill me, keep me full of the Holy Ghost, he knows he's had a bad day. You know, people have said half kidding that uh, they want to live in such a way that when their feet hit the floor, the devil says, oh, no, they're awake. (laughs) There's truth in that. We've got to get back to that fullness of power so that when we do come on the scene, Satan has to flee. Has to flee. All right. Let me close. As I said, You'll never know that you can walk on water till you get out of the boat. And folks, it's time to get out of our comfort zones. It's awfully easy to get comfortable with what has always been. You know, well, we're just going to relax here. Uh, We're going to be at ease in Zion. I'm saved. That's all I need. You know, I'm just waiting on the rapture. It's not what the Word said. He said, occupy till I come. Be about my business. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Go out and do these things. Go out and set the captives free. Go out and preach the gospel. Go out and heal the sick. Well, I can't do that. No, you can't, but the Holy Spirit can. Do you realize, and and it's just so awesome when I think about it, the same power that brought this universe into existence is resident in you if you're a child of God. The same power that reached into the grave and brought the body of Jesus Christ back to life is resident in every child of God. We got it. We got everything we need. We got the name of Jesus. We got the Holy Spirit. So what's the problem? We don't believe. We don't believe. Jesus said, he that believes the things that I do, he will do also in greater things. Folks, it's time To get back to the truth. Not man's ideas or philosophies. Not what the majority says, but what the Word of God says. You see, this is the truth. we got to get back to it. And the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Ghost. So we got to get back to that. The Bible says, in my name, you'll do these things. we got to get back to that. And we got to start doing them. And when we do... You won't have to worry about the church attendance. People will come to see what them crazy folks are going to do next. They will. I think it was John Wesley that said this. Somebody asked him, how in the world do you get the crowds that you get? He said, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. <laughs> he was so full of the Holy Ghost that he was blazing. And that's where we got to be. That's where we got to be. It's time to practice what we preach. It's time to get back to the power of the Holy Spirit. Either God's the truth or he's a liar. Either this word is true or it's a fairy tale. If it's a fairy tale, we're dead. But it's not. It's the truth. It's the word of the living God. All right. I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Father God. I thank you so much that you've given us everything we need to do what you've called us to do. As the Father has sent you, you're sending us. You, through the power of the Holy Spirit, used the miraculous, the supernatural, to reveal a miraculous, supernatural God. And you expect us as your children to do the same to reveal you to the world and you expect us to do the supernatural by the power of the holy spirit to reveal you to a lost and dying world god we failed miserably we we admit that we confess that to you today but lord this day we ask your forgiveness we confess it and we repent of it and lord you said whoever confesses and repents will be forgiven 
So we do that today. And Lord, we ask you in all boldness, Lord, fill us to overflowing with the Holy Spirit and with fire. God, we want the fire of God that causes the incense to rise up before you. That's a sweet fragrance to a lost world. God, we want the power, the fire of the Holy Spirit to do those things you've commissioned us to do. And Lord, we want to step out and begin to do those things in the name of Jesus. So I pray for every person that's here today. And Lord, the first prayer, and the first prayer I always want to pray forever, Lord, until you take me home, is for anyone that may not know you. Any person that's not saved because they may not, know, they may not see tomorrow. They may ha not have another opportunity. So Lord, I ask you right now, if there's anyone in this room that's not right with you, if there's anyone in this room that's not saved, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would convict their heart. I pray that you just reach out and touch that heart and cause it to know. Cause it to know how much you love them, Father. And cause them to know how desperately they need a Savior. Because all have sinned. Every one of us have sinned and come short of your glory. And the result of that sin is death. But Lord, because of your mercy and amazing grace, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And I pray that that conviction and that revelation would fall on the heart of any person in this room that's not saved today. And Lord, I ask you that you would grant them the precious gift of repentance. That they say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've sinned, and I ask you to save me. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I give my life to him. Lord, I know if they'll pray that prayer from the heart, they'll be saved. Father, I pray for any person in this room that may be saved but has drifted away from you. And I pray that this is the moment, Holy Spirit, that you will convict a heart and show them how much Father God desires for them to come home and wants to wrap his arms around them and restore them. Let this be the day for them. Now, Father, for all of us that know you, Lord, I pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. God, I pray that you'll ignite us, that we may go out and ignite a lost world for Jesus, that we'll be able to reveal him to this world. Father, I thank you that we can through the power of the Holy Spirit who is given to us in the name of Jesus.